Hello, my name is James Splittich from Stanford University, and I'm excited to be here to tell you part three about a brief history of muscle biology. And in part three, we're going to be dealing with calcium regulation of muscle contraction by the tropomyosin troponin system. And I was asked, actually, to give a more of a personal account uh, to this story because, in fact, working on this system is how I got my start in muscle biology many, many years ago. And that start happened in the wonderful town of Cambridge, England. It's my very first trip abroad. Uh, and I was going to work at the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, England. The year was 1969. Now, if you're in Cambridge, um, you simply cannot miss what's called the May Ball, because this is an event that happens in May every year, and the whole, all of the students from the university turn out in black tie for uh, an all-nighter dancing in the streets. It's really quite amazing. And so my wife and I had to attend this, and here we are um, before going to the event, is why we still look awake. Um, and this was just great fun. But, of course, I spent 99.9% .9 of my time in the lab. And, um, in fact, I was only there for two years. So, unlike modern postdoctoral periods, you know, in order to learn structural biology, which is what I went there for, uh, there wasn't all that much time uh, to do this. And, uh, I, and, and I went to work with uh, Hugh Huxley, uh, famous muscle biologist, but I didn't know much about muscle because this was not my background in training. And he said, what do you want to work on? And I said, well, um, let me read up and see where I think the interesting questions are. And he said, fine. And no one was working there at all on the tropomyosin troponin regulatory system, but I became fascinated by reading papers from Ibashi's lab in Japan, who had identified this system, purified the proteins, and were studying them, and decided to work on this. Now, this slide actually show, gives you the bottom line of how the system works. So I'll tell you that, and then we'll go back uh, historically uh, to, to, to discover sort of what went into these discoveries. But, um, you know, when the muscle is relaxed, it turns out the troponin component of the tropomyosin troponin complex, the troponin here is shown as a red ball, schematically. That's the component that binds calcium ion. Calcium ion in your relaxed muscle is sequestered in the endoplasmic reticulum of the muscle. And the, and the endoplasmic reticulum in the muscle is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so, in a relaxed muscle, that's where all the calcium is, and the calcium in the sarcomere region itself is at about 10 to the minus 7th molar, okay? which is too low a concentration to saturate the troponin binding site. But when you stimulate the muscle to contract, the, the sarcoplasmic reticulum dumps all this calcium into the uh, environment of the sarcomeres, and the sarcomere concentration goes up an order of magnitude to 10 to the minus 6th molar, or about 1 micromolar. And that's a high enough concentration to bind to the troponin. And the binding of calcium to the troponin causes the tropomyosin, shown here as a wiggly black line bound to actin, it causes that tropomyosin, to which the troponin is bound, to move. And it moves from this configuration, where it's actually blocking the myosin binding domain, to a position revealing these blue dots, uh, which are depicting where the myosin actually binds. So the calcium moves the tropomyosin, uh, which was sterically blocking the myosin binding, uh, allows, allowing myosin to now interact, and you get contraction. And that's basically how this works, and it's quite well known now. Now, this was not known 
when I went to Cambridge in 1969. And as I said, Ibashi and his colleagues had done a wonderful uh, many years of, of work characterizing this tropomyosin troponin system. And this paper, which was published in 1967 in the Journal of Biochemistry uh, by Otsuki, Masaki, Nonomura, and Ibashi, um, shows an experiment where they identified the location of troponin in the sarcomere with antibody staining. Okay? And what they found was the troponin is clearly staining the I band where the actin is. And you could see that it's making little tiny stripes. And those stripes have a periodicity that's very close to the 36 nanometer repeat of the actin filament which makes a two-stranded rope crossing over each other. And so that helical repeat of the actin is 36 nanometers. And this was very, very close to that, really a very striking image. So I decided I wanted to study this, uh, but with purified proteins. Now, it turns out in those days, actin, which had been around since 1942, as I described in an, in a, in an earlier uh, seminar in the series, was always contaminated with tropomycin troponin. And so if I wanted to study the interaction of these two proteins, I had to separate them from one another and get really highly purified actin and really high, highly purified myosin. I'm sorry, highly purified tropomycin troponin. Uh, and having done that, I could then mix them together or not. And what you see here is just one of my electron microscope images using negative staining with urinal acetate where you can see the crossover points of the actin helical uh, two-stranded rope with a periodicity of about 36 nanometers. If I had tropomyosin troponin present, then what I saw was something similar, but you could see little knobs along the filament. And those knobs had a periodicity that wasn't exactly the same. It wasn't 36, it was 38. Now, the way to really convince yourself that this is 38 and not 36 is by getting an optical diffraction pattern shown on the far right of such structures. In part C, let me just mention, are a bunch of actin filaments at now lower magnification that have been assembled into a pericrystal by adding magnesium. And when you make these magnesium pericrystals, you can see the troponin stripes which are kind of equivalent to what, what Otsuki et al. showed in the, in the sarcomere that I showed you just in the last slide. When you look at a diffraction pattern, we're going to get into diffraction patterns more toward the end of this seminar. So I'm not going to get into it much here, but let me just emphasize that you can separate out these periodicities. Uh, the troponin periodicity, for reasons you'll understand, in, in a few slides coming, uh, will give you what's called a meridional spot. The meridian is the line that runs up the center of the diffraction pattern here. And if you look down here, you might be able to see a weak spot, and that comes from the troponin periodicity. This spot comes from the actin helical crossover periodicity. And it's on what's called the first layer line of the actin diffraction pattern. So the distance from the equator, which is this line that goes across this way, to those spots is different for those two sets of spots. The actin periodicity from the equator up to that spot is 1 over 36 nanometers, because it's reciprocal space. And the periodicity from the equator to the troponin spot can be quite accurately measured to be different, and it's 1 over 38. So this is one of the things that diffraction gives you that is very, very useful. Okay, so it turns out that the reason the troponin is 38 and not 36 is that it's, it's determined by the fact that one troponin binds to one tropomyosin molecule. And one tropomyosin molecule, tropomyosin being a coiled coil, very similar 
to the coiled coil you find in the myosin tail. So you have a coiled coil tropomyosin that turns out to be 40 nanometers long. And what happens is these bind to each other end on end to make a long tropomyosin polymer. And that polymer is what you see here winding around uh, the actin filament. And, and since it's 40 nanometers with a little bit of overlap with one troponin binding, the troponin ends up being uh, having a periodicity of 38 nanometers. So it's just a, it's not set in any way by the actin periodicity. Um, notice that tropomyosin is often abbreviated as capital T small m and troponin as capital T small n. And so in this slide, uh, the actin tropomyosin troponin helical construction that, that I was able to carry out as a postdoc in uh, Hugh Huxley's lab, in the presence of calcium, this is important, showed that the tropomyosin doesn't lie in the dead center of uh, the groove formed by the actin. Now, you should, I should point out that what you're looking at here is a cross-section of the actin filament where you're looking at the actin filament on end coming out toward you, okay? So what you see are the uh, one protofilament here and the other protofilament here of the two-stranded rope. And the tropomyosin, as I said, is a little off-center from the groove of those two, of that two-stranded rope. As if one tropomyosin is kind of governing what goes on with this protofilament and the other one with this protofilament. So that was the first discovery that was interesting. But more importantly, what do you see when you remove calcium from the system? And what we saw was this density went away. And we saw some sign of density extending further out along um, this double-stranded rope. And this was interesting because this was precisely already known from a 3D reconstruction with actin and myosin bound done just the year before um, in, in Huxley's lab is the, is the area that myosin wants to bind. And so it looked like that this might be sterically blocking that uh, binding site. And we said in the paper, quote, each long pitch chain of the two-start helix may be individually controlled um, by its own tropomyosin filament and perhaps by direct steric blocking of myosin attachment. So since that time, which was 1970, um, this tropomyosin troponin and actin filament uh, alone and with tropomyosin troponin has been reconstructed numerous times by several different really excellent scientists who kept taking advantage of increasing, uh, ever increasing ability to get higher and higher resolution information because cameras kept getting better, uh, electron microscopes kept, kept getting better, better and better. And so uh, here's an image of Actin, which may not look as good to you as my image of actin from 1970, but this image that I took was by negative staining and neuronal acetate, which kind of gives you the outline of the molecule and gives you a lot of contrast, but you lose a lot of information about a higher resolution structure. If you instead, which was developed much later, uh, uh, in, in electron microscopy. If instead you take the actin filaments and you rapidly freeze them in the water in which they exist, then you, you don't have much contrast because you're just comparing the protein contrast to the water around it. Uh, but there's no stain. It's in its normal aqueous environment. And so you have the opportunity to have a lot more uh, resolution when you reconstruct this. And so with cryo-EM, as it's called, you can get uh, a much higher resolution reconstruction of this two-stranded rope that we call the actin filament that has its periodicity, as I said here, about 36 nanometers from the crossover point of this two-stranded rope. So 
just a short course, a really short course in how to think about uh, reciprocal space and what's really going on when you carry out these 3D reconstructions. Because I know all of you look at 3D reconstructions all the time. You look at X-ray crystal structures all the time. But you may not have sort of a gut feeling about what's really going on uh, to get this kind of information. And so I'm going to try to give you that today. Uh, so you start with the EM image, if you're doing a 3D reconstruction from electron micrographs. And you look for really straight filaments in this case. And you box them off, as I've done here with this little red box. So that you, and then you, you take this density information that's within the box, and every xy coordinate, you transfer that density information into reciprocal space by doing what's called a Fourier analysis. And this is just a set of mathematical terms that have a lot of sine and cosines that basi basically um, relate the real space to reciprocal space. And we're going to get to that in just a moment in a little more detail. And you get a diffraction pattern. Now, the point is that the background noise in this image and the irregularities in the filament, be there any, do not give rise to spots in the diffraction pattern, because the spots only come from periodic structures. Okay, and the more of those periodic structures you have, the stronger the spot is. So if you get to reciprocal space, you can do something that's very hard to do in real space. In reciprocal space, you can filter out all of this background that's not in the spots. And by filtering that out, you can then, by doing an inverse Fourier analysis, get back a structure which is now a filtered image and has a lot more resolution to it. And if it's a, if it's a helix, then if you think about it, only one view of a helix gives all the 3D information you need to reconstruct a 3D structure. So that's what's done in the case of the actin tropomyces troponin. So in the next few slides, I want to just give you a really thumbnail idea of how to think about real and reciprocal space. So go back to your high school or college class where, in physics, you made slits. So let's look at these black lines and think of, think of them as slits, uh, as you maybe did in your physics class. Um, in some solid object. So you've made these slits, just the black lines. And you shine light through that. And you, and you then focus at the right plane behind uh, the, the slits, and you get a diffraction pattern. And such slits, you'll remember, will give you a spot on the diffraction pattern on what's called this line, which, as I said, is called the meridian. All right? And if you kept all your magnifications correct, the distance from the origin right here up to this spot is 1 over whatever the distance is in real space. So if this distance is a nanometers, then this is 1 over a nanometers. Okay. So if you're with me so far, let's also look at the red slits. Now, the red slits have two features that uh, are different from what I just said. One is they're closer together. And because they're closer together in real space, they're going to be further apart in reciprocal space. That's why it's called reciprocal space. Furthermore, because the slits are now slanted, if you did this experiment and made slits that look like this, you would end up with a spot that was not on the meridian because of this slant. Instead, the spot would go from the origin in reciprocal space at the same angle that these are in, re in real space. So from the origin here, you would go up to this spot in the right quadrant. And the distance from this spot to this equator would be 6 over a nanometers, 6 times further from the first spot. And notice that I've drawn these red spots so they are integrally related to the black ones. So that if you count them, starting from here, 
there's one, two, three, four, five, six before you get to the next black slit. Okay? That means that if you make layer lines, where this is layer line number one, which is the furthest periodicity in the real space, then this is on the sixth layer line. Now what I've done is I've made another set of slits in green. And if you count from here up to the black, there's actually seven of those. So, and it goes off at the other angle. So if you start at the origin, you get a spot that's now in this quadrant, but on the seventh layer line. So this could be a real structure if I superimpose all these slits. Um, and you can see that the slits have some relationship to each other in this real structure. And so this would be the beginnings of what your diffraction pattern would look like. Okay? However, uh, the upper half of the diffraction pattern, I mean, you can sort of think about it that you're looking at this from the bottom up, but you could also be looking at this from the top down. And so you're going to get a set of spots that are equivalent in the lower half of the diffraction pattern. Furthermore, this is, this is sort of the set of spots that you would see if you're only looking from this side of that object. But if you were standing behind the screen and looking at it from the back side, you would actually get the opposite set of spots. So in fact, a structure that looked like this in real space would give this diffraction pattern. So if you followed this so far, you could tell me what would happen to this black meridional spot if I took these black slits and I tilted them to the left. Now that you know the answer because you figured it out, let me show you. Here we've tilted those slits. The center is still A apart, but they're tilted. And of course, what happens is the black spot moves over to the first, staying on the first layer line, but moving over off the meridian. Now, turns out that this structure that I just outlined here is the, peri the main periodicities you see in the two-stranded rope of the actin filament, where the, the long pitch uh, protofilaments give rise to these black layer line densities. And then the way the pairs of actin monomers going up the filament um, provide pairs of actin density, you get either the red density or the green density. And so this first layer line, sixth layer line, seventh layer line, very typical of an actin diffraction pattern. Okay. So, come back to that in just a moment, but given the really high resolution cameras now available and the improvements in electron microscopy, one can now get a helical reconstruction of tropomyosin troponin on actin that is very, very high resolution in such, such that you can even see uh, alpha helices and even beyond these days. It's really remarkable. And this is one great future of structural biology is being able to look at big complexes at really very, very almost uh, molecular resolution. And this particular uh, reconstruction, where, you know, the trophomycin is actually in a very similar place it was years and years ago, but you can now see even the trophomycin coiled coil, shown here in yellow. Uh, and this was done by von der Ecken et al published in just two years ago in Nature, in 2015. Okay, in this same paper, von der Ecken pointed out that if you do these reconstructions in, the, in very low calcium concentration, the tropomyosin is fitting in a position that is kind of outside the groove of that, of the, of the true protofilaments of the actin, in what they call the A state, okay? But when you increase calcium, because it's come out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and now is flooding the sarcomere, and the calcium binds to tr troponin, that binding troponin causes the tropomyosin to weaken 
its association with actin. And now it's a little more flexible, and it can move between this A state shown in yellow and what they call an M state shown in blue. And because it's moved to that blue position, this steric blocking by the yellow filament is now uh, relieved somewhat, and the myosin head can come in and begin to try to bind to its binding site. The tropomyin's still a little bit in the way, but now there's a competition between where the tropomyosin is and where the myosin is binding. And when you go from the weak binding of the myosin to this strong binding state, that forces the tropomyosin into the M state to stay there. And so what happens is there's a kind of a cooperativity in the muscle. It's not just calcium binding to the troponin that causes the tropomyosin to move, but the myosin coming in as a consequence of a little bit of movement of the tropomyosin now pushes the tropomyosin, if you like, the rest of the way. And so heads that are binding actually facilitate other heads binding. All right. This movement of the tropomyosin can be observed in a live muscle because here's the relaxed state of a live frog sartorius muscle. And guess what? Maybe you can see better over here because I've got the numbers. You have spots on the first layer line, the sixth layer line, the seventh layer line, just as we were predicting. This is now looking at a live muscle fiber. But notice, in the contracting muscle, you have a spot appearing on the second layer line, which wasn't there in the relaxed muscle. Now, I know that you've all already figured it out from my very lucid explanation of real and reciprocal space, why the tropomyosin moving to the center groove of this two-stranded rope of the actin gives rise to a second layer line spot. And for those of you who haven't figured it out, um, you'll figure it out in the next half an hour when you go and have your coffee and think about why this should happen, given everything I told you earlier. So that's your homework. All right, final experiment I want to talk about today is just an amazing experiment, um, not talked about a lot, um, but a very phenomenal, important experiment done by, uh, from, from Hugh Huxley's lab by Cress Huxley Faruqi Hendricks in 1986. And again, everything depends on technology development. So Hugh Huxley was doing low angle x-ray scattering on muscle from his PhD thesis with rotating anodes that gave, you know, unfortunately not very strong x-ray beams to better and better rotating anodes that he himself was involved in developing to get better and better strength of x-rays. And then along came synchrotron radiation, okay, as spelled here, which comes um, out of, you know, cyclotrons uh, or the Stanford Linear Accelerator, for example, where you can get extremely high densities of x-rays. And what this does is allow you to measure these reflection changes that we've been talking about, the I1011 change, which talks about heads moving out toward actin filaments, or the second layer line change, which is what describes the, tro the tropomyosin moving into the groove. Uh, and simultaneously, you're doing this with a live muscle, simultaneously you can measure tension development. Okay? And in this remarkable experiment, uh, you can see the scale down here is time in milliseconds. So the first thing you see when you stimulate the muscle to contract and calcium flows in, is that the, the second layer line spot changes in a way that indicates the tropomyosin has moved. And then only a few milliseconds after that movement occurs, the I1011 reflection change changes in the diffraction pattern, which is indicative of the myosin heads grabbing onto the actin. And then a few milliseconds later, you end up seeing the force development. So the time sequence is just beautifully uh, what you'd expect to see uh, from the story that I've been telling you. All right, to summarize this part three, 
Calcium regulation of muscle contraction is really pretty well understood now. Tropomyosin troponin operates by a steric blocking mechanism. Really important part of my talk is to uh, point out to you that electron microscopy is, is now, in these modern last couple of years, amazingly giving you the ability to get very high-resolution information about structure. I hope that you've learned something about how to think about real and reciprocal space where you don't have to worry about the uh, integral equations and differential equations involved in the Fourier analysis. Uh, it's really quite simple and easily understood in terms that I described. Uh, and then, importantly, I finished with this millisecond time scale, uh, low-angle X-ray scattering of live muscle, revealing steps involved in this calcium regulation. I think one of the things I hope that you're getting out of part one, part two, and part three of this series is if you want to understand some complex thing like muscle contraction in biology, you actually have to have an enormous number of different approaches. Uh, and, and I think the muscle business is one that has brought together, you know, physicists, uh, biochemists, um, uh, muscle mechanics folks, um, et cetera, to bring together every different possible approach you can think of to understand how this system works. And that is what it takes to understand biology at this level. So thank you for being with me for part three. Uh, I do have a part four of sorts to come, which is a research uh, program that, uh, ex set of experiments that I want to describe to you that came out of a dream. And if you want to know about that dream, join me for part four. Thank you very much.